Hi, my name is Anthony McMullen, Assistant Professor of Business Law at the University of Central Arkansas and the current Vice Chair of the Arkansas Bar Association's Mock Trial Committee. This is the Mock Trial Lecture Series sponsored by the Arkansas Bar Association's Mock Trial Committee and the Arkansas Chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates. And this topic we're going to discuss the Mock Trial Rules of Evidence. The Mock Trial Rules of Evidence are the rules that determine whether certain testimony or certain evidence is admissible at trial. When students are preparing for their case, they should determine whether a piece of evidence is admissible or not, and they should be able to provide the arguments, therefore, in the event of an objection. In competition and in a real trial, whenever making an objection, a lawyer is obligated to make that objection as soon as the objectionable testimony is elicited or given. A lawyer cannot wait five minutes and then say, oh, by the way, I object, and this objection is based off of something that came up five minutes ago. No, you have to be ready as soon as the testimony is provided. The thing about the mock trial competition is that students know generally what every test, what every witness will potentially testify to. And so st good teams will go through all of the witness statements and see what testimony is objectionable or what testimony might get an objection. That way you can plan your arguments in advance and as soon as you hear or at least think that that objectionable testimony is about to come up, you can come up and have your objection ready. Whenever you have an objection, you can't just yell objection and the judge rule on it. You have to have a reason. And particularly in the mock trial co competition, not only must you have a reason, but you generally must be able to reference the rule that you are alleging is being violated. Now, a little secret. Most lawyers in the real world know the rules. They don't necessarily know the rule numbers. So when you as a student come up and say, according to rule 403, this testimony is inadmissible due to unfair prejudice, you're going to impress a lot of attorneys. But for the purposes of our competition, you must be able to reference the rule number and the actual rule that you believe is being violated. On the flip side, if you're the proponent of that testimony, then you have to be able to come up with a defense. You have to be able to come up with the reason that you believe that the testimony is admissible. And of course, the judge will make the ultimate ruling on that issue. Now, as a reminder, there are objections that are outside of the rules of evidence, and you'll see most of these in Rule 4.18, things such as being argumentative, like a foundation, assuming facts not in evidence, and so on. The focus of this video is not to cover these things, but a lot of these are specifically covered in another video. In addition, we're not covering Rule 4.20, how to introduce an exhibit into evidence. That's also covered in another video. However, I do remind you that you need to review that rule as far as how to introduce specific exhibits into evidence. The rule provides a pretty good script, and if you're able to follow that script, you'll have all the information that you need. The major topics for this video you'll see on your screen. The relevance rules in rules 401 through 403, character evidence, rules 404 through 405, Impeachment, which is rules 607 through 609. Hearsay, which is rules 801 through 804. And lay and expert opinions, rules 701 through 705. There are a lot of other rules, but if you have these rules down, then you probably have a good 90 to 95% of what you're going to need to know for a competition. In addition, these rules are as they are stated on May 16th, 2016, the date that we are recording this video. It's possible that this video will be made available to students four, five, six years down the road, and you'll need to make sure that the rules of evidence are still consistent. If there are any updates to the rules of evidence, we'll be sure to track them on our mock trial webpage. And if those are substantive changes, then you'll need to be sure to adjust anything that's being taught in this video. But if it's close to May 16, 2016, then everything that you should see here should be up to date.
Let's start with our first topic, and that's this idea of relevance. Under Rule 401, relevant evidence means evidence having any tendency to make the, ex the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the act more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. Long definition, I know. Basically, if it's helpful, it's relevant. If it's not helpful, it's not relevant. Now, Rule 402, paraphrase, is that if it's relevant, it's admissible, unless it's otherwise excluded from another rule. If it's irrelevant, then it's inadmissible. For a piece of evidence to be relevant, you need to think of two things. What is the evidence, and what is the proposition that you are seeking to prove with that evidence? And these slides, I've designated those as E and P. So the evidence must help to establish a fact. And the proposition, it must be a fact that is relevant to the case. Now, that proposition doesn't necessarily have to be one of the elements of the crime or one of the elements of the cause of action. I provided you an example on the slide here. If you have a murder case or if you have a homicide case, oftentimes the motive is not one of the elements of the crime. However, Common Six dictates that someone with a motive to kill somebody is far more likely to kill somebody than someone without a motive. So even though motive is not necessarily an element to the crime, motive is certainly relevant in establishing whether a particular person did or did not commit the murder. So if you have evidence as to motive for the crime, it is certainly relevant and in many cases, it's going to be admissible in a particular crime. So again, the primary rule is if it is relevant, it is admissible. If it is irrelevant, it is not admissible. What might make something inadmissible? Well, first, it might be irrelevant. In other words, the evidence doesn't help in some minimal way to establish the fact that you're establishing to introduce. It might be immaterial. In other words, the evidence that you have might relate to the proposition that you're trying to prove, but the proposition for which the evidence is being introduced has nothing to do with the case, or it might be incompetent. In other words, it might be relevant and it might be material, but there's some other privilege or some other rule that excludes that evidence. An example of something that might be incompetent would be something that would fall under lawyer-client privilege. Most people know that if, your attorney, if you say something to your attorney then that attorney has the right to keep that information confidential. So if you're, someone tries to call the attorney to testify against you, that information is going to be incompetent because there's a privilege that protects that information. Now, even though evidence is relevant, you may have to deal with Rule 403. Although, although relevant, evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, misleading the jury, or by considerations of undue delay, waste of time, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Now, while this is a pretty long rule, the portion that you'll probably deal with the most in the mock trial competition is undue prejudice. In other words, you're going to use Rule 403 when you have a situation where the unfair prejudice is so high and the probative value of the evidence is so low that you might as well exclude the evidence. I provided you an example on the screen. Now this is probably not something that you're going to get in actual competition, but hopefully it gets the point across. Let's say that it's a homicide case and the prosecution wants to admit colorful, graphic, detailed, but very gory pictures of the photo scheme. I mean, think of the goriest picture that you can think of, one that borders on making you physically sick. Unless that photo shows how the victim was murdered, and unless how the victim was murdered was relevant in that particular case, then chances are that's going to do, that picture's going to do nothing but inflame the jury. 
and you generally aren't going to need something that gory and that graphic to get your point across. So the probative value is going to be pretty low. So under those circumstances, an objection under Rule 403 may be in order. The uh, chance of unfair prejudice is too high, the probative value is too low, and so for those reasons, that testimony ought to be excluded. Now, even though I'm not specifically covering them in this video, I recommend that you go over rules 407 through 411 on your own. In each of these rules, you have a certain piece of evidence that the rules state is inadmissible for certain propositions. So for example, rules 407 for subsequent remedial measures. Subsequent remedial measures are inadmissible to prove negligence or product liability. However, they are admissible for a number of other propositions, such as proving ownership, control, feasibility or precautionary measures, or any other things. In each of those cases, you have certain evidence that is excluded for certain propositions. And while they are not used in every single case, you should still be familiar with them um, when you start your mock trial journey. Our next topic is character evidence. And there are a lot of different things that come out of rules 404 and 405. Let's go over them in detail. So rule 404, the main part of rule 404, Evidence of a person's character or a trait of a character is not admissible for the purposes of proving action in conformity therewith on a particular occasion, except. And we'll get into the exceptions in a minute. What does this mean in English? You can't introduce evidence of someone's character if the proposition is that the witness acted in conformity with that character. So let's say you have a witness that has a strong penchant for shooting guns. If the purpose of introducing the evidence is to show that he shot a gun at the time of the incident in question, then that testimony is inadmissible under 404. However, if there are other reasons that you want to introduce that testimony, then that evidence might be admissible. So you've got a witness who has a reputation for shooting guns. It's inadmissible if you're trying to prove that the person shot a gun at the point in time in question, but it is admissible if you're trying to show something else, such as knowledge that the person knows how to use a gun. There's also a long list of other reasons why you might want to introduce that evidence, such as motive, intent, knowledge, plan, a long other list. If you're introducing that character evidence for some other reason, then it is admissible. It's only going to be excluded from evidence if the purpose is to show that the person acted in conformity with that character at the time of the act in question. But let's get into the exceptions. You've got three exceptions under Rule 404. You've got one exception for the character of the accused in a criminal case. You've got the text of that on the screen. It looks like a lot there. You've got the character of the alleged victim in a criminal case. There's a lot on the screen. You've got that there. At some point, you do need to read and understand what these two exceptions are. But let me see if I can help break these two exceptions down a little bit. Here's a summary of those last two screens. Now, first, these exceptions only apply in criminal cases. So if you're, the case that you're looking at for the current year is a civil case, this slide does not apply. It only applies in criminal cases. But if you do have a criminal case, here are, the, here are essentially what those two slides just said. The defendant can present evidence of his good character, but of course the prosecutor can rebut that evidence. The defendant may present evidence of the victim's bad character, but the prosecution can rebut that evidence. I hope that the prosecution rebuttal sounds natural and fair. If I'm going to show that I'm a good person, then opposing counsel should have the right to show that I'm a bad person. If I'm going to show that the victim was a bad person, 
then opposing counsel should have the right to present evidence to the contrary and that the victim was a good person. So those are the two exceptions that we saw on the screen. And by the way, remember that there's still the obligation for the evidence to be relevant, and there's still the obligation to get past Rule 403 discussed earlier. Now, the exceptions that I just went over were about the accused and the victim. But what about other witnesses? These are covered in Rule 607 through 609, which we're going to get to in the next part of, of this presentation. So hang on for those. Coming back to character evidence, what about other crimes, wrongdoings, or acts? Evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts is not admissible to prove character of a person in order to show action and conformity therewith, similar to the rule that we saw in the first part of the rule. It may, however, be admissible for other purposes, such as proof of motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident, and are subject to the limitations imposed by these rules. Take a look at the list of the other propositions here. I would be familiar with this list because these are other reasons why otherwise inadmissible evidence might be admissible. Make sure you have this list down. So let's say you have evidence of proving of character. How can you prove it? Here we go to rule 405. So what about reputation of a, or opinion? In all cases where evidence of character or a character trait is admissible, Proof may be made by testimonies to the reputation or in the form of an opinion. So, on direct examination, someone can say, hey, this person has a, the character or the reputation of being a fill-in-the-blank. But on cross-examination, questions may be asked regarding relevant specific conduct. So, if the witness gives testimony that the person has a reputation for being honest, then on cross-examination, they can be asked, are you aware that this person was accused of cheating on their taxes? Or are you aware that this person was accused, accused of cheating on the exam? You can cross-examine the person on specific instances of conduct that rebut the opinion or reputation that the witness just testified to. What about subsection B, oh, specific instances of conduct? In cases where character or a character trick is an essential element of the claim, charge, or defense, proof may also be made by specific instances of that person's conduct. You can bolster the testimony by specific instances of that person's conduct. Make sure that your witness is familiar with the person so that they can give that testimony as to the person's character. We next move on to impeachment. Impeachment is just a legal term for showing that the witness lacks credibility. Whenever a witness takes the stand in any type of case, their credibility is subject to being questioned, even before they've given a single word of testimony. So credibility is important, and it is important for attorneys to know how to question the credibility of a witness. Let's look at the rules here. First, we start with Rule 607. The credibility of a witness may be attacked by any party, including the party that called the witness. In other words, you can call your own witness, and if you believe that it suits your purpose, you can attack your own witness's credibility. In most mock trial cases, that will not be a good idea, but you never know. You may have that case down the road where you need to tank your own witness. And under the rules, that is perfectly acceptable. So once you've decided that you need to impeach a witness, how do you do so? Well, there are a number of different ways that you can impeach a witness, including introducing prior and consistent statements of the witness, showing that the witness is biased, showing prior convictions or prior bad acts of the witness, showing a reputation for untruthfulness, showing that the witness has an inability to recollect or observe, or just simply introducing evidence that contradicts the testimony of the witness. Now we're going to cover the first four of them 
in this video. First, prior inconsistent statements. If a witness gives a statement that is inconsistent with a statement previously made, evidence of the inconsistent statement may be introduced. And by the way, the statement is not hearsay. So for example, if you have a hypothetical case where a pedestrian is hit by a driver and a police officer testifies that the victim was found running against the flow of traffic, but if you've got a police report from that police officer that shows the victim was running with the flow of traffic, then the officer should be asked about this on cross-examination because his testimony is inconsistent from the witness statement. And once the, once the officer testifies that the victim was running against the flow of traffic, that, wit that police report becomes inadmissible to impeach the credibility of the police officer. Next, bias. Yes, if I commit a crime, I promise you that my mother is going to testify on my behalf. Once my mother is cross-examined, the first thing that the other attorney is going to ask, well, you love your son, don't you? And you do anything to make sure that your son's not harmed or will go to jail. Well, this is evidence of bias. If a witness is, we know that if a witness is biased, then it's very likely that they would be more willing to testify in favor of the person that they're trying to support. So biased testimony is relevant in order to impeach a witness. If you're going through your rules, you'll notice that there is not a specific rule that relates to biased testimony. However, because biased testimony is relevant, it is admissible. And so if you see opportunities to show that you've got a biased witness, make sure that you expose that during cross-examination. Let's look at impeachment by evidence of conviction of a crime. And for this, we go to rule 609. Now, the nice thing about this rule is that it's a pretty easy rule to read, and you can probably figure out a lot of this on your own. But still, let's take the time to go over it. Subsection A gives us a general rule. And let's go to sub A1. For a crime that was punishable by death or by imprisonment for more than one year, the evidence A must be admitted, of course, subject to Rule 403, in a civil case or in a criminal case if the witness is not the defendant, and sub B must be admitted in a criminal case in which the witness is the defendant if the probative value of the evidence outweighs its prejudicial effect to that defendant. I know those two rules seem almost identical. There's a small difference between the two. In sub A, in other words, if it's not a criminal case involving the defendant, if it's any other witness, then generally it's going to be admissible. Of course, you got to get past 403. So the presumption under sub A is that the evidence is admissible. Under sub B, however, you still have to make a showing that the probative value of that evidence outweighs its prejudicial effect. So there is a almost a presumption that it shouldn't be admitted, but you have to get over this hump. In a lot of cases, it's going to be easy. It's just going to depend on the particulars of the case. We've got a special rule, however, for crimes that involve a dishonest act or a false statement. So look at sub A2. For any crime regardless of the punishment, the evidence must be admitted if the court can readily determine that the evidence, the, that establishing the evidence of a crime required proving or the witness admitting a dishonest act or false statement. In other words, if the crime is one involving a dishonest act or if the crime is one involving a false statement, then you don't have to worry about many of the hurdles. That's always going to be admissible. Why? Remember that your credibility is always fair game whenever you get up on the stand. And if you're committing dishonest acts or if you're making false statements, then that's certainly relevant to your reputation for truthfulness. There are other considerations in Rule 609 as well. I've paraphrased them here. In sub B, generally, if the crime is more than 10 years old, then there's going to be a strong presumption that it's going to be inadmissible. 
you can get a, around that and the rules for that are in sub B. In sub C, if there's been a pardon, you can't use that crime. And then in sub D, you've got circumstances where you are using a juvenile adjudication to impeach a witness. Those rules are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to go over them here. You can read them in the event that they become relevant in your particular case. What about other bad acts? What about other, other evidence of a witness's character? Remember in 404, I told you that we talk about this in a different rule. We are now here. We are now talking about Rule 608, which is a rule that governs evidence of character and conduct of witnesses. So, sub A. The credibility of a witness may be attacked or supported by evidence in the form of opinion or reputation, but subject to the following limitations. One, the evidence may refer only to the character for truthfulness or untruthfulness. And two, the evidence of truthful character is admissible only after the character of the witness for truthfulness has been attacked by opinion or reputation evidence or otherwise. What does this mean? You have the right to present evidence of a witness's untruthfulness. But once you do, you make relevant evidence of a witness's truthfulness. On the converse of that, you cannot prevent evidence of your truthfulness until your credibility has been attacked. So you can always attack someone's credibility, but once their credibility has been attacked, that person has the right to introduce evidence of their reputation for truthfulness. Now, how do you do this? Specific instances of the conduct of a witness for the purposes of attacking or supporting the witness's credibility other than conviction of a crime provided by 609, so 609 is its own separate rule, may not be proved by extrinsic evidence. So you can't bring outside evidence in an effort to attack someone's credibility. They may, however, in the discretion of the court, if probative of truthfulness or of untruthfulness, be inquired into upon cross-examination of a witness. Number one, concerning the witness's character for truthfulness or untruthfulness. Or number two, concerning the character for truthfulness or untruthfulness of another witness as to which the character for a witness being cross-examined has testified. What does all of this mean? You can cross-examine someone on their truthfulness or untruthfulness. But of course, don't forget, again, you can only attack, you can attack their credibility at any time. You cannot bolster their credibility until their credibility has been attacked. And again, Rule 608 sub B provides the mechanism for doing so. The next series of slides that we have are on the hearsay rules, which are rules 801 through 804. So what is hearsay? Hearsay is a statement, which may be oral, written, or implied. It is a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying at a trial or hearing, offered in evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So let's say that I'm trying to prove that it rained yesterday. And I put a witness on the stand who says it rained yesterday. If I say, ask the witness, how does he know? And he says, I know that it rained yesterday because my cousin told me it rained yesterday. Well, that's inadmissible hearsay. You can't bring someone else's statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted. You can't use a statement from someone out of court to show that it rained yesterday. Now that being said, it is only hearsay if the purpose of that evidence is to prove the truth of the matter asserted. If you're trying to establish any other point, then that evidence is inadmissible. So if I'm trying to show why I grabbed my raincoat and I testify, well, I grabbed my raincoat because my cousin told me it was raining. Well, the proof that I'm, the point that I'm trying to prove in that particular case is here's the justification for me grabbing my raincoat, not necessarily proof of what, that it was actually raining. So if the point is to show a justification for why I grabbed my raincoat, then that is not hearsay because you're not, I'm not 
introducing that evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted. That will be completely admissible. So Rule 801 defines hearsay, and Rule 802 says that hearsay is inadmissible unless it falls within an exception to the rules. There are a lot of exceptions to the rules, but make sure you get the basic concept of hearsay down first. Even though you've got a good definition of hearsay in Rule 801, Rule 801 also excludes from the definition a number of things. One thing that it excludes is pro certain prior statements by a witness. So if you're trying to introduce evidence of inconsistent testimony, or if you're trying to introduce evidence of consistent testimony in an effort to rebut an express or implied charge against the person of a recent fabrication or improper influence, or if you're trying to introduce evidence of an identification of a person made after perceiving the person, all three of these are explicitly taken out of the definition of hearsay. Of the three of these, probably the most important is the one that you see in paragraph A. If it's a prior inconsistent statement, it is not hearsay, therefore it's going to be admissible. Also excluded from the definition is an admission by a party opponent. Now you get A, B, C, D, and E here. You can read all five of these on your own, but the key thing here about an admission by a party opponent is that any statement that is made by the opposing party or someone representing the opposing party is admissible as an admission. Now this rule only applies to the parties to the case. This rule does not apply to their witnesses unless the witness is also an agent of that party. What would be an example? You're the plaintiff in the case. You want to testify that the defendant said certain things. Well, the defendant is a party to the case. So you can testify to anything that the defendant said without worrying about the hearsay rules because that would be an admission by a party opponent. Rule 802 stated that hearsay is inadmissible unless there's an exception to the rules. Rules 803 and 804 go over those exceptions. And in this video, we're not gonna go over all of those exceptions. We could probably do entire hour on just the exceptions to the hearsay rule. But in your mock trial preparation, you should go over these exceptions and look over which ones apply. Now, there's a big difference between 803 and 804. Some of the exceptions you see in 803, presence and compression, excited utterance, mental, emotional, physical conditions, statements for the purposes of medical treatment, rec recorded recollection, records of regularly conducted activity. And there are some others in 803 as well. These are general hearsay exceptions, and they apply all the time. 804 is a different set such as formal testimony, statements under belief of impending death, statements against interest, statements of personal or family wrong of history or forfeiture by wrongdoing. These exceptions only apply if the person making the statement is unavailable to testify. So 803 exceptions you can use whenever you want. 804 exceptions you can only use if the person making the statement is unavailable to testify. So that's the, that's the big difference between the two lists. And 804 provides a pretty good definition for unavailable to testify if this is something that you're wondering about. So on your own, be sure that you take the time to go over this list of, of exceptions. And if you see something in the mock trial case that looks like it's going to be hearsay, see if any one of these exceptions apply and be prepared to argue if there's any gray area. The final topic on our slides is opinion testimony. Now, even though opinion testimony is in the 700 rules, we start with this basic rule in Rule 602. A witness may not testify to a matter unless evidence is introduced to support a finding that the witness has personal knowledge of the matter. Evidence to prove personal knowledge may, but need not consist of the witness's own testimony. 
And of course, this rule is subject to the provisions of 703 related to opinion testimony by expert witnesses. In plain English, you've got to be able to know about it before you testify to it. But let's get to the main opinion testimony provisions. What about lay witness testimony? Lay witness is just any ordinary person in any particular case. If a witness is not testifying as an expert, testimony in the form of an opinion is limited to one that is A, rationally based on the witness's perception, B, helpful to clearly understanding the witness's testimony to determine in fact an issue, and C, not based on scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge within the scope of Rule 702. Most ordinary people can get their opinions admitted as long as it falls within these three parameters, and it's not difficult to fall within these three parameters. That being said, if a witness gives opinion testimony, then the basis of that opinion is subject to being cross-examined. So, if you are the person introducing this in opinion testimony, make sure that your witness can provide an adequate basis for his or her opinion. What about expert testimony? Well, 702 provides that if scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will assist a trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue, a witness qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, expertise, training, or education may testify in a form of an opinion or otherwise. Again, the person is going to need to lay a foundation for the basis of their opinion, and then they'll be able to use whatever their expertise is in giving their, ex in giving their expert opinion. And we won't go over them here, but Rules 703, 704, and 705 provide more details as far as the expert testimony. So, I hope you've enjoyed this brief tutorial on the Mock Trial Rules of Evidence, and I wish you good luck. Thank you.